can you please put your hands together and welcome Pastor Sean Nefstead to the stage. if you're grateful for the grace of Jesus Christ. Come on, anybody grateful? You can do better than that. Remain standing for just a moment. Uh, it is my distinct honor and great privilege to be here on such a significant Sunday as your six-year anniversary. Um, I don't know that every church goer understands or realizes what it takes to not only take a church from the beginning, the conception, but journeying, growing, discipling, giving, sharing, raising up leaders. And um, we've known your pastors now for a few years, and I just want to let you know how blessed you are. <laughs> All glory to God. But we also have no problem honoring a man and a woman who've laid down their life for you. And I wonder on a significant Sunday like this, um, we don't want to elevate a person and give them extra glory. All the glory is God's. Just, we don't touch his glory. But I wonder, is anybody grateful for your pastors? Come on, watching online. Come on, show your love. Way to go. Way to go. I think this is the season that you ought to pray like you've never prayed before. Amen. You ought to give like you've never given before. Go through the growth track, serve on the team. Come on, everybody. What God is doing here is not normal. You need to learn to appreciate that. Build the house of God. Fall in love with Jesus and loving people because this church is going to be so incredibly impactful to the region. As you grab your seats, why don't you just turn and tell somebody, I'd be the best looking person in the room if it wasn't for you. <laughs> I'd like to show you a picture of my family, uh, my wife of 25 years, and my four beautiful girls, and my new son-in-law as of a year and a half ago. And um, I don't know if we have a picture. I think you can see them up there. Yeah, we had four girls under the age of two. Yeah, some of you are trying to do the math on that one. It'll hurt your brain. We had a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and twins were zero. Now they're 23, 22, twins are 21. We're really good planners. A lot of estrogen in the house. Sometimes I just walk in the room and start crying for no reason at all. We did get a male dog, and I have some great news, ladies and gentlemen. My daughter is now pregnant with our first grandson. <laughs> Guys, I don't know what I'm going to do with a boy. I'm such a girl dad, <clears throat> but I am so excited about that. And um, I am grateful to be here. I feel like I am on assignment. Uh, there were a couple of the churches, two other churches that had asked me to come and one in the south, one in the east coast, and I felt like I was supposed to be here. Because I feel like what God's about to do is impart something to you. And we're seeing droplets of revival. Let me just break it down very, very simply. Revival is God's response to hunger. Did you hear what I just said? Revival is God's response to hunger. Raise your hunger level, you'll find revival. We're starting to see it right here at this church. And today, I, I want you to take some very good notes because I feel like I'm here to break off some insecurity. We are not normally confident by nature. We're insecure. And sometimes we mask that with pride and arrogance and I know in my own life I have struggled with that. But if you're going to go where God is leading you as a church, you're going to have to leave that insecurity behind. <clears throat> I would like to preach a message to you based on a phrase that we commonly use, but it's a change of the phrase. We have heard the phrase growing up, what you see is what you get. 
What you see is what you get. You've heard people say that to you. I'd like to change that and say, what you see is not always what you get. Turn and tell somebody right now, what you see is not always what you get. What's interesting is we live in a world that is constantly sizing people up. You did it this week at the job, at a store. We even did it here at church. It's where you get a first impression based on your first encounter with somebody. and You make a preconceived notion about them. Have you ever had somebody look at you like this? They could be thinking, I really like your outfit. That's not how we take it. But you get a preconceived notion on somebody, and you think you know them. You think you have pinned them. But how, how many of you have ever been wrong before? Like you ever seen somebody, and you're like, they can't play basketball, and then they beat you? you ever seen a singing show, and you're like, they can't sing, and then they blow your mind? Have you ever looked at somebody and thought, man, they look so mean, and they become your best friend? Because oftentimes we are wrong in our preconceived notion based on a first impression, and we did not know that there was more that meets the eye. This is the case of a story in the Bible. Forgive me for going so basic today. But a little boy named David. The prophet Samuel came to Uncle Jesse's house and said, one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. So Samuel comes in, and when Samuel comes, by the way, some people are like, I want a prophetic word. I want somebody to prophesy over me. You would not have wanted Samuel to prophesy over you because that brother read your mail. He would come to town, and people were scared, like, oh, are, are we good, Samuel? Are we good? Everything okay? Came to Jesse's house, and Jesse was so excited because he thought, one of my sons is going to be the next king of Israel. And they bring the first boy up, firstborn, and he's, he's handsome, he's strong, He's the rightful person, and then all of a sudden, go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, hmm, he ain't the one. Do not consider his appearance or his height. And he vertically challenged people, glad about that. He said he's not the one. Then the Lord says that the Lord does not look at things the way God, I mean, people look at them. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at, at, at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So he says no to the first son. Second son comes up, and he's almost like a Steve Harvey moment, like he crowned the wrong person. Maybe it is my turn. It, I, I knew I was special. I knew I was always living in the shadows of my older brother. Maybe it is me. The Lord says no to that guy. No to the third guy, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven sons. No, 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 no. And then Samuel is a little perplexed. He says, do you have any more kids? And they're laughing like, well, there's David, but we didn't even invite him to the party. Like he's out there watching sheep. Like this is, it's not him. I can tell you it's not him. And then this is what verse 12 the prophet said, so send for him. I'm not going to sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him. They brought him in. He was glowing, probably had a spray tan, <laughs> fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise, anoint him. This is the one. What you see is not always what you get. It must have been very difficult for David to realize he was anointed and then overlooked by his own family. I've come to realize if you're going to serve God for any length of time, you're going to have to be comfortable and okay with knowing you are anointed and yet not accepted. What you see is not always what you get. I'm not sure who I'm talking to today where you have felt like God has given you some pretty big dreams and then you tried to share them with somebody else and they look at you like, oh, that's cute. I don't think you should even start to believe God in that level. I know you. You're just a David. Can I give you some advice, E2 Church? Never view your calling through the lens of somebody else's limitations. <laughs> Because otherwise, we'll start to categorize ourselves in a different way. We'll start to think there's us, and then there's superhuman Christians over there. 
Like, God can't use us. I mean, this is Sacramento. This is California. Maybe in another city, in another church, with somebody with a large Instagram or a large following on television, may I also remind you, God does not look at things the way we look at things. And oftentimes, what, is, what we overlook is actually attractive to God. God is looking. He's not looking for somebodies. He's looking for nobodies. He doesn't use a somebody because a somebody is full of themselves. And if, they, if God were to use a somebody, they would steal all the credit. God's always looking for the underdog. He's always looking for the nobody. Because when God uses a nobody, everybody steps back and says, oh, it wasn't their talent. It wasn't their ability. She can hardly even sing. That boy can hardly preach. But I'll tell you, the hand of God is on them. And when they speak, it draws me in, in their business, in ministry. Because what you see is not always what you Turn and tell somebody what you see is not always what you get. Yeah, yeah. Turn and tell somebody else. Just tell them this. You don't look like much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't look like much. <laughs> but then again, neither did David watching stinky sheep on the backside of a desert, and God would choose him to slay Goliath, turn around and become a hero to the nation, and become the greatest king Israel has ever known. Joseph didn't look like much, thrown in slavery by his brothers, human traffic, falsely accused, thrown in prison and forgotten, and God would elevate him to become second in command of Egypt and give him a strategy that would save thousands of people's lives. Noah didn't look like much, but God told him to build a boat with no Home Depot when it had never rained before and he saved his family. Moses didn't look like much floating down a little river in a wicker basket from Hobby Lobby, but God would use him to save a million and a half people. Esther didn't look like much, but with a quiver in her lip and a hesitation in her step, she would go on to save her people from annihilation. Peter didn't look like much, denied that he even knew Jesus three times, and Jesus would turn around and rebuild Peter, call him back on mission to become one of the greatest leaders of the new. Paul didn't look like much. None of us would even hire him on our church staff, but God would take him and make him the greatest missionary the world has ever known and use him to write one third of our New Testament that encourages our hearts to that Jesus didn't look like much in a borrowed horse trough and he would become the savior of the world. I'm here to tell somebody you might not look Look like much right now, but God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. What you see is not always what you. Because God has placed a little something in you called potential. That's why the growth track is so vitally important. The growth track is a class we have here at the church. It's two weeks. What if I told you you could discover your, your purpose and gifts in two weeks? Would that be worth it? Absolutely. The most connected people at any church are those serving and in small groups. You could be as connected as you want to be. And I'm here to tell you, growth track is the membership class, but then it's something to help you discover your potential. And growth track ought to be, if I'm, if I'm being honest, my whole goal of today, I want you and everybody to go through growth track, get on the team, begin to get in these e-groups. They're small groups. You're like, what's a small group? It's a group that's small. <laughs> Just do life and build. I promise you, your life will come alive. Now, a lot of leaders will sit underneath the funnel of growth track at churches and go, give me my leaders. That's the wrong way to approach growth track. The proper way is, how many families am I putting in growth track? How many people will be there because I encourage them to take their step? Because if you sit in service, you're, you love the preaching of your pastors, you love the worship, it's incredible music, your kids are being ministered to, and, and that wears off in about three months if you don't get involved. So somebody take a step. Because potential is defined by this. It's, it's, it's existing in the realm of possibility. It's capable of being developed. So if we're insecure leaders, how is God going to use us if we stay here? 
if we never believe that God can actually do something through me. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. I love this verse. The Bible says, where God is talking, he says, don't despise these small beginnings. For the Lord just rejoices to see the work begin. Don't you love that? That God doesn't expect you to be here immediately. Sometimes we do. We have a vision of what God told us, and we think we're going to be there tomorrow. There's a little something called the waiting room that God escorts us into as soon as he gives you the dream because he's trying to develop you, but he is excited that you just are taking some steps. My daughters, when they were young, four girls under two, triple stroller. You've seen a double stroller? We had a triple stroller and one on a leash. <laughs> when, they, when they took their first step, we were so excited. I mean, I have my camera, my video camera. I don't mean like a camera phone. I'm talking about a camera. How many remember back during the 1900s? Looking like a news anchor man, cameraman. It was, it was one off balance step. It wasn't even a good step. They're, they're standing there all wobbly. And then they take one step. It wasn't like it was a, a useful step. They didn't run around the block. They didn't run to the store and get something useful like eggs. Or, like, by the way, why are eggs so stinking expensive right now? Easter's coming. I'm afraid we're going to have to start painting and dyeing potatoes this year. This is ridiculous. Anyway, I digress. <clears throat> When our daughters took their first step, we were watching, waiting, video camera in hand, and they were like, one off-balanced, awkward step. When they took that step, my wife and I lost our minds. We were like, oh, that's my girl. That's my girl. She's so advanced for her age. Send that video to everybody. Let me tell you, when you take one small step towards your purpose, one small step towards your calling, all of heaven rejoices, and your heavenly Father says, oh, that's my girl, that's my son. He's just as so excited that you're taking a step. <clears throat> Ephesians 3.20 is a great verse that God can do immeasurably, exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. We love that part, but we miss the last two words. He does all of this great stuff Within us. Most people think, well, ministry is just for the pastors. Okay, me, your pastor, we're not even really ministers. We're pastors. Ephesians 4, 11, 12 tell us where to raise you up to do works of ministry. What the Lord told me a long time ago, that's literally what it says. We are to train and equip the saints for works of service. For works of service. Say, for works of service. The Lord told me in 2020, maybe we didn't do as great of a job equipping the saints for works of service. Maybe we just equipped them to attend a service. Your calling, your potential is awakened when you're making a difference in somebody else's life. When you're serving, we go home tired after three services, but we're like, that's how you live a day connected to purpose. People's lives got changed. Marriages are being healed. Kids are coming back to Christ. This is what we call the church. But the Lord does this stuff through us. God is great. It's an axiom that will always be true and very easy to say. But there's a few of you in this room. You won't just be able to say God is great. You will be able to say God has been great through me. He wants to use you on your job, in your family, in your school. And I know, I know this is a big picture type stuff, and it could be a little intimidating. Listen, if, if it wasn't bigger than what you thought, it wasn't God. It's okay. It's okay, though. Remember hand-me-down clothes growing up? Anybody got hand-me-down clothes? Those are the clothes your parents didn't buy. They just received from a cousin that, that you didn't really like those clothes, your older brothers or sisters. We never liked hand-me-down clothes. Why? They never fit. But what'd your mama tell you? Don't worry. You'll grow into it. Look, 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 look. Your calling will always be bigger than you at first. <laughs> the vision of E2 Church is always too big at first, but you're growing into it. I said you're growing into it. 
God has a purpose. God has a plan. There's the city to reach. There's a region to reach. And what you see already is just barely scratching the surface of what God is going to do in this church. Come on, clap your hands and say a good amen. Let me give you three things. Number one, here's what it's going to require. Increase your faith. Get your faith level up. Start believing God for greater things. He really is a great God. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. It's not that it's difficult. It's not that it's hard. It doesn't happen. So no wonder the devil's been attacking your faith recently. Because without it, you can't please God. And then I've had some people come to me and they're like, pray for my faith. Pray for my faith. They sound just like that. And I'm like, I can pray for your faith, but that's not how faith comes. Romans tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you are not reading the Bible, your faith is not growing. Did you hear what I just said? Christians, look at me, look at me. At some point in your life, you're going to have to read this book. This is what we're basing our life on. We're not, we're not being led by feelings. We're being led by the standard of the word of God. Some people are like, I don't, I don't know where to start. Here's a great place to start. On the inside. We've had some people leave other churches to come to ours, but when they come, they say a very interesting statement. They say, we left our last church because we weren't being fed. Excuse me? I wasn't being fed. I'd starve too if I only ate once a week. <laughs> Is this okay? We have more Bible than we know what to do with. We have like real Bibles with pages. We have, Bi if you don't have a Bible, go to a hotel and take that one. They'll be okay with it. We have Bible apps that literally will read it to you. If you're too lazy to read, it'll read it to you in a British accent. 15 minutes a day, you can, you can literally read through the whole Bible in a year on a plane. 15 minutes a day can save you on your car insurance. Well, 15 minutes a day can also save you from a lot of bad decisions when you get the Word of God inside of you. I wasn't being fed. What? The only people who cry when they're hungry are babies. Grown folks get up and make themselves a sandwich. Come on, everybody. It's time for us not to just come to church to be fed. We come to serve. We come to build. There's somebody out here. This is their first time ever. And how, how can I ignore a first-time guest when they're just coming to Christ? And I've been saved for 10 years. Church is no longer about me. It's about him and them. <laughs> get your faith level up. And I feel like your faith is growing. There's a hunger in, in the atmosphere for more of God. Number two, increase your faith. And number two, increase your leadership. Increase your leadership. God's calling all of us to lead something or someone. Paul told a young man named Timothy, who was a young preacher, timid, had some stomach issues. I have, I have all that. And he said, don't let anybody look down on you. He said, for your youthfulness, but I would add, for anything. But be an example in your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity. Don't let anybody look down on you for any reason. Just learn to be the example. Learn to set the pace. Learn to create a culture in your home that's stronger than the culture trying to deceive your kids. <laughs> Lead. God's looking for leaders, and the devil is not afraid of who you are. He's afraid of who you might become. Like if you ever woke up and realized you are anointed and you are special and God has called you to a unique thing, oh my God, if you would wake up to see the potential on the inside of you. But you'd agree with this. Finding your potential and your purpose is not enough. You then have to take some steps the growth track. And another step, get on the E-team. Speaking to serve and make a difference. Like, we don't show up to church on Sundays for us anymore. We, tur we turn around and say, let's serve some people. Anybody grateful for the E-team? Come on, clap your hands. Just making room for people. It's taking a step. you got to increase your leadership. And here's what leadership is. It's taking people from where they are to where God wants them to be. Period. It's helping them on the journey. Anybody grateful 
that people were giving before you got here? Anybody grateful that, that people were praying before you showed up? Anybody grateful for the team that was serving on the day you showed up? Like you, were, you weren't even sure if you wanted to come in. You're in the parking lot gripping your steering wheel, and you're like, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. And then you saw one of those greeters with the dumb sign, Sunday's fun day, Sunday. And you're like, I think I'm going to be okay now. We can come in. And they made the experience welcoming. Anybody grateful for that? All right, it's our turn to turn around and do that for somebody else. Get the insecurity off of you. You cannot... You can't really focus on people if you're focused on you. If you don't know who you are, you're a leader. There's leadership inside of you. You could lead people. And when I say leadership, don't just think stage platform leadership. I'm talking about in your business, in your family, lead. Almost take the stage out of the equation. This is not like if you got here, you haven't arrived I know a lot of great preachers who are not great leaders. Preaching may inspire. Leadership leads people somewhere. Have you ever been, have you ever been behind somebody at a light? They get a green light. They're playing a lot of loud music. They're on their phone. And when it's their turn to move, they don't move. How many of you honk right away? I mean, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's like green hunk. All right, how many? You give a grace period. Two, three second grace period. You're like, you know what? I've been there before. They might go to E2 church. Let me just give them a two or three seconds grace period. I drove in a minivan for 17 years. I'm not proud of that. And I never even used my horn. I was embarrassed. Because I wanted a manly horn. I wanted a, I wanted a fog horn. Because you, you communicate stuff with a horn, don't you? When you honk and you got that GMC horn, it's like, wah, wah. You're, you're communicating something like, move, get out the way, get out the way, move, move. That's what you're saying. My, my minivan horn was dainty. I just wouldn't even use it. I, I wanted to, oh, oh. my horn was like, me, me. It was like, excuse me, excuse me, could you please pull up a little bit? Like, I, I, would, I, would, I would sit at lights, and somebody in front of me didn't go. They, I'd go through a whole cycle of lights and refuse to honk my horn. I'd rather just roll my window down and be like, honk, you know, just. But we all know the frustration of being behind somebody. They're making a lot of noise. They sure are interested in everybody else's life, but when it comes to their time to move, they don't move. This is applicable in every area of leadership. If you're running a business, a corporation, church, small groups, band, anything, how dare we lead something that's not moving? Increase our leadership. Be learners of culture, be learners. When you come to this church, it's not, hey, I went to another church, let me tell you how to do this. No, it's like, what do I need to do to become this church's type of leader so I can begin to serve and build in the community? Because this church is doing something, I wanna be a part of this, let's go make some more stories together. And it's not about a title. I know people with titles who are horrible leaders, and I know people who don't have a title who are some of the best leaders I've ever seen. It's not about a title. Here's what you need for leadership. Ready, ready for this? You might want to write this down. Write this down. Here's what you need for leadership. You need leadership. Did you catch it? You don't need a title. You need leadership. And then number three, be dedicated to being developed. What I love about your pastors is that they have a heart to develop you. What you learn here is going to make you a better husband. What you learn here is going to make you a better wife. What you learn here is going to make you a better employee, a better boss. You're going to take the principles, the leadership principles here, and apply them in your business and understand it, 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 it's all predicated based on your hunger level. Your hunger level determines what you consume. Romans chapter 5 says it this way. Paul says, we glory in sufferings. Okay, look at me. No, we don't. We, we actually don't do that. 
None, there's not one person here today who was like, you know, I went through hell this week, up top. <laughs> but he says, you can glory in sufferings because we know something. What do we know, Paul? We know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. We want hope without character. We want hope without going through anything. Your leaders are not great leaders because they've just arrived. Your leaders have been through some stuff. They've been walked on. They've been talked about. They've been mistreated. And they still show up with a smile in their face and faith in their heart and a hunger to see you grow. I'm telling you, be dedicated to becoming developed. A mentor puts something in you. A coach pulls something out of you. Your, your pastors are coaching you for this season. And when there's an open door, praise God. And when there's a closed door, praise God. We don't, close, we don't, we don't get excited for closed doors. But you could. Because God's the one who opens and closes. A closed door is just as good as an open door when it's God. Did you hear what I just said? We can come in and be like, hey, Bro, I asked her out. She said, no. I didn't get the position I was applying for, and I thought it was rightfully mine. Up top. God's developing you because one of the worst things to do is get to a place where God's calling you, but you don't have the character to sustain it. We live in such a Kodak generation. We are overexposed and underdeveloped. God is developing us to become greater leaders. So not only do we need to just understand what it means to be anointed and not accepted, I believe you also need to know how to live where you know you're anointed and be silent. David understood that. He was picked to be the next king and went right back to the fields to watch sheep. Somebody else's sheep. David understood that. Paul got saved and spent three years in caves being developed before he would become the apostle Paul. We understand that all these people, Moses knew that. Jesus knew that. It was, Jesus didn't do a miracle until he was age 30. We have one picture of a junior high Jesus and nothing else. Just he's anointed but silent until age 30. No miracles until age 30. Are you following me? I'd have been messing with people. Like, it's a good thing I wasn't Jesus. I'd be at the junior high swim party like, hey, 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 watch this, watch this, watch this. <laughs> Mary would be like, Jesus, get in the water. Get in. Okay, mama. <laughs> Jesus didn't do one miracle. And before he ever did a miracle, look, look, look. We have two conversations from the father to the son. And he said the exact same thing both times. He said, this is my son. I love him. I'm well pleased. This is my son. I love him. I'm well pleased. What he found in this, before he ever did a miracle, it wasn't based on performance. It was based on position. He found, this is my son. That's acceptance. I love him. That's affection. He said, I'm well pleased. Look, look, look. That's affirmation. You need to know what your heavenly father sees in you. He says, you're his child. Acceptance. He loves you. That's affection. And he's pleased. That's affirmation. And you better find affirmation before ministry. Because otherwise you will look for affirmation in ministry. And you'll never find it there. The children of Israel. When they walked to Jericho, God said, I'm going to give you the land. This is yours. Can you imagine how excited they were for 40 years in the desert? And then they run. To, oh, this is going to be amazing. This is great. This is great. And they had their swords and their spears. Like, what do you want us to do? Give us the marching orders. God's like, I got a great plan. Here's the plan. You ready for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk around for about six days. and Shut your mouth. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to walk around for about a week and shut your face. Take your face, shut it. 
So they knew they were anointed. And for six days, this was them. Now, you, you, you know us. We'd have been talking smack. <laughs> We'd have been taunting, making up songs like, these walls are going to fall real soon. Going to make you look like a baboon. Shout. Got that loud friend, starts talking. Like, Shh, okay, I ain't going to say nothing. I ain't saying nothing. But I communicate with my eyes like, you know, you, you, or you're going down. You, you up there, you're going down. For six days, anointed, but silent. I don't think it's very easy to know you're anointed. And be quiet. Because usually when God picks you, you want to scream it from the mountaintops. But if you go in too early before God opens the door, we won't be ready. But if you wait for God, you won't have to say a word. David didn't say a word. Samuel came and said, this is the one. We never like to embrace the season that we're in. When we were in junior high school, couldn't wait to be in high school. When we were in high school, we couldn't wait to be in college. When we were in college, couldn't wait to be married. Some people, they're married, couldn't wait to be divorced. <laughs> Too far, Sean. <laughs> it's like the devil always has you living in one season ahead of your season or one season behind your season. So you miss your season. This church is in an incredible season. Embrace it. Build your faith. Build your leadership and build this house. Listen, listen, because prep season always leads to blessing season. Don't forget, it's all about Jesus. John 15 says he is the vine. We're just branches. Stay connected to Christ and stay connected to the church. Amen, everybody. Amen. Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands and say amen. Could you stand to your feet with me? I want to pray for you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed everybody watching online in this room I feel like the Lord does want to break off insecurity he wants you to step up and realize the leadership potential inside of you and if we're going to go as a church where God's calling us to go where your pastors are leading the church it's going to require all hands on deck. So just ask him right now, Lord, break off insecurity of my life. And what is my next step? Just ask him, what's my next step? Speak to me, Lord. And Heavenly Father, I pray over this magnificent church. I thank you for six years of your faithfulness. There have been trials. There have been difficulties but you have remained faithful. And for that, we are eternally grateful. I pray that you would take this church into the next season. Let it be marked by great grace and great growth. Let us reach more people with the love and the hope and the healing of Christ. And let this church be raised up as an army to let people know about your love. In Jesus' name, amen.